Uh, all right, we're going to be in Mark, uh, the end of Mark 8 and Mark 9 tonight. Um, so if you want to turn there, you can, but we're going to start with a word of prayer. Um, and then I will get into a recap and some things behind the scenes in the world behind the text. But first, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight, and thank you for our opportunity to once again dive deep into the book of Mark. Uh, God, we ask that you would illuminate for us what you want us to see, um, and that we would see clearly who you are as we read through these stories, revealing Jesus's identity to us. Help us to have a greater appreciation for who Jesus is and what Jesus does for each and every one of us. And so, God, we ask that you inspire us tonight, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so quick recap. Mark has already let us know that this Jesus that he's telling us about, he is king, he is Lord, not Caesar, Jesus. That he is the son of God, not Caesar, Jesus. And that he is the embodiment of good news. That simply his presence is good for all of humanity. Most of what Mark has told us to this point is about Jesus' ministry. He's traveling around, he's teaching, he's healing, he's casting out demons. And then in the last week or so, um, in the passages we've read, he's done some miracles that are absolutely fascinating and profounding, uh, where he feeds 5,000 and then again feeds 4,000 out of a very small amount of food. He walks on water. He's able to see his disciples far off from uh, a mountaintop. Um, he has the ability to affect the elements in ways that only God can. We also see increasing tensions between Jesus and his followers and the religious leaders of the day and the Roman authorities, and that is starting to, to come to a boiling point. And throughout Mark, outsiders, people on the fringe, people who are outcasts, social pariahs, they are included in what Jesus is doing. In fact, many of them have a clearer sense of who Jesus is and what Jesus is up to than the insiders, the disciples, his own family, and of course, the religious leaders. So all of these are major themes that are playing out through the text thus far. So as we look at the world behind the text, uh, I was actually inspired by Pastor Don yesterday. He very briefly talked about Gnosticism. So I want to talk a little bit more about what that is, because it actually applies really well to what we're going to cover tonight in the book of Mark. So, yes, I am going to spell it for you, uh, because I imagine you may not have come across this word before. And I don't know why I started with an S, because it starts with a G. Uh, Gnosticism. Yes. Or like, you may have seen this word before. Right? So the A, A in Greek means no or not. So agnostic, so this word is the root, gnosticis. Or, um, Gnostic, um, it means knowledge. So agnostic literally means I don't know or I don't have knowledge of. Gnosticism then means that these are people who believe that they have a special kind of knowledge or a secret knowledge. So the Gnostics, they believed that they um, had a secret knowledge of reality, of, of all parts of reality, and there are different Gnostic sects, so there, there were some variations of belief, but generally speaking, they believed that they had received a secret knowledge, and their highest value was spiritual insight or enlightenment. So if you were to go back and read texts that Gnostics wrote in the ancient world, 
they wouldn't spend very much time talking about sin. They wouldn't t um, touch on repentance all that much. And, and, and they really didn't care a whole lot about how a faith is lived out. What they really cared about is, are you enlightened? Has the illusion of life been suspended so that you can see what is really happening behind the scenes? That's how they thought about things, that the truth is veiled. It's, it's beyond our normal comprehension unless you have been enlightened in some way. So the Gnostics generally, they were like secret societies of folks, folks who they believed had this secret knowledge. They got to be a part of their little club, and anyone else is an outsider. They don't get to be a part of the secret knowledge club. But one of the big things, and Pastor Don alluded to this in his sermon yesterday, that the Gnostics believed is that matter um, is either evil or at least um, fallible or flawed, that the material existence is not good. Just inherently, it is not a good thing. That the spiritual, the beyond physical, is where the good things are. And there are flawed spiritual beings or existences in their view, but the, the most good thing is God and whatever God does. However, as Pastor Don mentioned, their belief was that that good, good, good spirituality could not mix with the very flawed physicality of the world that we experience. So they believed that the God of the universe didn't actually make the physical universe. Um, they believed, depending on which group of Gnostics you talk to, that there was either a demigod in between the Supreme God and us, or a series even of demigods, that, that God created a demigod, that demigod created another demigod, and that demigod created another demigod, so on and so forth, and each creation led to one that was more flawed than the next, until eventually a very flawed, uh, malevolent demigod created the material universe. Well, that's a lot of rules. Yes, <laughs> right, yes, it is a lot of rules. Okay. The basic idea is that the good supreme God could not have created the material universe. That was the Gnostic view. And as Pastor Don rightly pointed out, that, that um, had, runs right in the face of Genesis chapters 1 and 2, right? That this good God has created the material world. It also runs in the face of what most Christians were saying about who Jesus is. Because right from the beginning, there were Christians saying that this Jesus, he is God and he is human. And they weren't really quite sure how to combine that. They viewed it as a mystery, but they still wanted to hold to both of those statements being true. That Jesus is fully God and fully human. The Gnostics did not like that view, right? They, uh, they, they thought about it in a couple of different ways, depending on the sect of Gnosticism. Um, some Gnostics believed that Jesus was essentially an angel of sorts, um, that he wasn't really physical, and that he spread a message. Remember, angel means messenger, so primarily his goal as an angel, as a messenger, was just to reveal what the supreme God wanted people to see, and that they were to then encounter their secret revelation of God through Jesus, the angel. So some Gnostics thought about it that way. Uh, but then there were Gnostics, a specific group of Gnostics called the Docetists. And they they believed in docetism. Uh, and docetism means... Where's my definition? At? Oh, there we go. Um, docetism comes from the Greek word for illusion. 
so they actually believe that Christ's physical body wasn't real, that it was like a ghost or an illusion, that's the name. So he looked like a human and he acted like a human, but he wasn't really a human. He didn't really have physicality because he is good, right? He's spiritual. Were these, were these groups big? <laughs> they, act, they had some influence, yes. They weren't, they weren't huge, but they, but they did have some, some influence, certainly. <laughs> I'm sure they had some sort of way of keeping people in and keeping people out. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and I, I, I should say, too, that Gnostics, um, the, they um, could be found in all sorts of different philosophies and religions. So there's Jewish Gnostics, and then there became Christian Gnostics. And I use that with quotes because uh, historically, and in an orthodox view of Christianity, uh, we would not say Christ's body was an illusion, but they would refer to Christ as some sort of prophet or powerful being or even a god, but as mentioned, that this god didn't actually have physicality to him. So this is in the backdrop of what's happening in the ancient Near East at this time. There's a variety of different worldviews that are all mixing together. And the Gospels and the writings of the New Testament are often trying to combat different views all at the same time. And Mark is certainly trying to do that as well. And as we read through the text tonight, what I want you to be paying attention to is how Mark describes physicality just physicality in general. Is that a good thing, a bad thing, an indifferent thing? But also specifically Christ's physicality. How does he talk about Jesus as a physical being alongside of Jesus as divine, as God? And how might that differ or be similar to how the Gnostics and the Docetists would have thought? about Jesus. So keep that in the back of your mind. I know, I know these are big ideas that you're just starting to learn about and wrap your minds around, but, but I'm, I'm guessing you'll be able to pick out some things from our text tonight that help you to see how Mark is responding to the ideas of the Gnostics and specifically the Docetists. Um, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to split you into five groups. And I think we've already kind of created our groups, which is great. I'm going to read through our entire section that we're going to cover tonight. But I'm going to assign each group one passage or one section of the passage that I want you to really focus on. And as I read, what I want you to do is take little notes from within your section of things that stand out to you or questions that you have. And then after I read through the whole thing, you're going to get together in your group and talk about what happens in your section. And you're going to highlight the things that you highlighted when I read through it, the things that interested you, the things that popped out, and the questions that you had. And then in your conversation together, what I want you to do is to come up with two things. I want you to come up with, number one, what is the main point or theme of that particular passage? And then number two, what is one question that you all in your group share from that passage that you want to talk with the whole group about? So one main point or theme and one question that you want to discuss with everybody from the section that I give to you. Okay, everybody got that? Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to assign the sections to you so you know which section to be paying attention to. Not that you shouldn't pay attention to every section, <laughs> uh, but specifically pay attention to yours, okay? Mm -hmm. 
Let us listen well to the way the Spirit moves through our reading tonight, starting with Mark chapter 8, verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. So Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Uh, let us put up three shelters, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He didn't really know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd gathered around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. And when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. 
He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. <laughs> Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he had placed among them. Taking the child into his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who sent me. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worms that where the worms that eat them do not die, and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves, and be at peace with each other. All right, take a few minutes to discuss with your group what's happening in the section that was assigned to you. Note the things that stood out to you, the questions you have, and then come to a consensus on the theme or the main point and one question from that section. All right. Pat, you can keep writing. We're, we're going to turn our attention, our attention, attention, attention. attention. words, attention. words are hard. Uh, our attention to Russell and Marilyn. Oh, no. uh, what do you believe the main theme or point 
of the section that you had, which was the end of chapter 8 and the first verse of chapter 9. Well, Jesus was telling, or t- telling them again, giving teaching. He didn't do too many miracles. He was still trying to teach them who he was. Mm-hmm. And it was foretelling his death and resurrection, but they still didn't get it. Because Peter said, you are the Christ. And then a little while later, he's rebuking Jesus. Yeah. And then Jesus rebukes him, telling him it's demonic when he did. <laughs> so, but then they go on. He's telling them in the next part, when he says to take up your cross, he's telling them how wonderful the kingdom of God will be if they can get their act together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, very good. Very good. What was the question that Why you had? Why can't they get their act together? Why can't they get their act together? Yeah, that's a good question. It's yeah. a common theme, and every week they go through it. Yes, well... Flat on board story. This is just the way Mark <laughs> portrays them. Yeah, they just... Yeah, they don't... Get it. Although there, it's kind of a fascinating tension because Mark over and over has been like, the disciples don't get it, the disciples don't get it, the disciples don't get it. But the beginning part of your section, yeah. Peter does kind of get it. For a bit, yep, yep, he gets, just he gets a little part of it. He seems to know that Jesus is the Messiah. But as the rest of this section plays out, his version of Messiah is not the same as Jesus's. Okay. So for Peter, and probably most of the rest of the disciples, they probably had a view of the Messiah, that the Messiah was going to be this great conquering hero, this military leader who's going to overthrow the Romans so that Israel can have their own nation again. And so when Peter says, you are the Messiah, there's a sense in which Jesus is affirming that, but notice that he doesn't really say anything beyond that at that point. He just warns them not to tell anyone about it. Probably because, once again, it's continuing with Mark's telling of this messianic secret. It's not quite the time to tell everyone yet. But if, if their viewpoint is that the Messiah is going to be this great conquering hero and word gets out about this, it's going to throw everything that Jesus is up to into havoc. So that's probably another reason why Jesus is like, hush, hush, on that point. So then he goes into a teaching about what that then means for him to be the Messiah. And immediately he tells him, we're going to die. Well, I'm going to die. Me, Jesus. Um, And then he then says... And whoever wants to be my follower, you got to take up your cross too and follow me. And so Peter, again, because of his view of a Messiah, he's like, Jesus, you're talking crazy, man. So he pulls him off to the side. And, and Mark, what a great way that he describes this. Peter pulls Jesus off to the side. So you can imagine, let's say you're the disciples, Peter, and I'm Jesus. Peter pulls me off to the side. I'm now facing him, and Peter's rebuking me. I now turn around. That's the way Mark describes it. Peter is at my backside when Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. He's literally behind me. Now, uh, probably not so much demonic uh, when he says, get behind me, Satan. Remember what the word Satan means? That means adversary. 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 In other words, Peter is acting adversarial to the mission of Jesus. Uh, so, so Jesus is using this play on words to say, Peter, you don't get it. You're acting opposite of where we need to go. Right. I need to go to the cross. You're thinking, I need to take up the sword. Oh, right, exactly. He's selfish enough to say, let's do this. Yes. 
Certain, I mean, Mark doesn't outright say it, but likely Peter wants Jesus to be this conquering hero, and they all want to be a part of his inside group that's conquered everything so that they can get power and glory and acclamation after Jesus comes into his kingdom. Right, exactly. Yeah, because he, he still thinks... We are about to incite a revolution. Maybe Napoleon. Right. 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 <laughs> Which is why Jesus then does the teaching at the end of 8 going into the first verse of 9 about whoever really wants to be my close follower will have to deny themselves. Peter is not denying himself. He wants power. He wants fame. He wants to be uh, admired. They must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. This would have been really hard for them to hear. And, and in some ways, you, you can kind of understand why the disciples, as we continue to read through this section, uh, still won't really get that because it just is complete opposite of what they would have normally thought, their worldview. The cross was a weapon of shamefulness that the Romans used to kill political dissidents. Um, so people who were killed on the cross were literally shamed. Like, people did not want to talk about them. They didn't want to acknowledge their existence, much less any sort of familial or family connection. So hearing Jesus say, you must pick up your cross, you must deny yourself, those are not values of the ancient Near Eastern world. Those are antithetical to what most people would have wanted to do and where they were supposed to go, at least from their own societal viewpoint. Sally. I, in defense of Peter, you know, I think it was part of you know, Peter's love of Jesus, too. Yeah, probably so, that he has developed this real relationship, real relationship with Jesus. Jesus. He's definitely the spokesperson for them and the leader of them. Yeah, you see that in multiple ways throughout the book of Mark. We're seeing it in a couple of ways here in the sense that he spoke up on behalf of the disciples. He's going to do it again later in uh, what we're reading tonight. Um, so, yes. Um, I, I do think you're absolutely right. So I think it's, it's what you're describing, this love of Jesus. We don't want to see him die. And we also want to get something out of this. Well, when he says that uh, he's going to die on the cross, and then he tells them that you're going to pick up, your, you're going to pick up the cross, are they thinking that they're going to die along with him? And maybe they're afraid? That's very possible, yeah, because that's certainly, Mark here uh, and, and Jesus' words, they, they can be interpreted both literally and metaphorically. In one sense, it's a metaphor that to deny yourself is to allow Jesus to direct your life and whatever that looks like. Uh, but it could also be very literal. And it, from what we know in Christian history, most of the disciples are martyred. Um, and Peter, um, upside down on a cross. Um, so many of them will end up going to the cross, literally. Um, so yes, I, I'm, I'm sure that there's an element of fear of what could happen. Um, and that's part of why Jesus addresses shame in 38 and then verse 1 of chapter 9, because they're, they're probably just, of, just as afraid of the violent way they could die as being shamed by their community. Um, and so when Jesus says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the angels, um, it should give them pause to think, okay, who, who, if, am I, 
If I'm going to be ashamed by someone, who do I want to be ashamed by? Is it my friends and family or Jesus? Because if what Jesus really is saying is true, that he is going to die, but he's going to come back to life, then there's something to be said for going to the cross because that's pretty magnificent, which is why uh, Jesus then says in verse 1 of chapter 9, uh, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. In other words, they, they are going to see what is going to happen when Jesus makes it to the cross. And it's actually going to be an exemplification of God's power because in the end, he doesn't stay dead. He comes back to life. Yeah. Very good. Next section. That's right. The, the transfiguration. Mark and Jessica. So we think the theme or the point was actually that Jesus reveals himself to them physically as God. Um, because when it says that his clothes were white as white as anything could be white, uh -huh. to, to me, or the way that we interpret it is that it's God. But I think for them, they could not see that because I think they were thinking back to like Moses and, and when God followed them through the desert, he was either a cloud or he was fire, right? He never, nobody could look at God without dying. So I, I don't think that they could see him as God. That's, that's what we got out of it. There's a couple questions. What do you think he was saying to Moses and Elijah? What's that conversation? And could they hear it? And two, um, can God only be seen by man in a human form without a human dying? Oh, good questions. Really good questions. Yeah. I think your, your main point is spot on. Um, and, and good job of thinking in the back of your mind about what's happening with the Gnostics and the Docetists. And... For some people in the ancient world, they would have read this and would have said, oh, it's a secret. He's revealed just to three people, and he doesn't have, like, he, he's not fully human. But as you rightly pointed out, Mark actually wants to keep him human. He points out that he still has clothes on, and it's this, his clothes are transformed as much as he is. Uh, so Mark wants to kind of play like there is something really magnificent and spiritual happening and he is still physical and he is um, beside Elijah and Moses having this conversation. Uh, as far as your first question goes, I have no idea what they're talking about. Um, and These guys still don't get it. That could be. That could be. That could be, um, yeah, it would, it would, anyone who tries to guess, it'd be pure speculation because Mark doesn't give us any sense of their conversation. Uh, it does give us a sense from Peter's reaction about how the disciples are thinking about this whole interaction. Peter, again, speaking on behalf of James and John, says, uh, it, uh, it, it's good for us to be here. Uh, let, let's, um, uh, I, I imagine they, like he's just like, first thing that pops into his head, uh, uh, let's build some shelters for you. Um, so it seems as though one of two possibilities are happening there. One, Peter thinks that um, because they're in the presence of something that is absolutely miraculous, that they should build some sort of shrine to what's happening. So that's one possibility. The, the other possibility is that uh, this is a momentous occasion for Thanksgiving. Um, and one of the ways that the Jewish people express Thanksgiving is through a festival called the, the, fest, or the Feast of Booths or, or Tabernacles. Different parts of the Bible um, describe booths or tabernacles differently or, or use different words. 
Um, but essentially, it was a Thanksgiving feast that happened after the harvest. So this is a way, potentially, that Peter's like, well, we, well we're very thankful for what is happening right now. And this is Elijah and Moses. And let's, let us build a tent for you, uh, some shelters, uh, so that we can have a great feast. And then as soon as this interaction takes place, it's poof, over. Um, but not without a couple of other really, really significant images and um, words here. First, uh, the cloud appearing. Um, this whole scene has echoes of Exodus chapter 24 in it. Um, in Exodus 24, um, Moses goes up on Mount Sinai, and he is up on the top of the mountain with God in a cloud for seven days. Um, for six of them, he's there in the cloud just kind of waiting, and then on the seventh day, God speaks to Moses. Um, so when at, at the very beginning of this passage, when it says after six days, that's our first cue that Oh, oh, something like what happened on Sinai is about to happen here. And then the cloud confirms that. The cloud is symbolic of God's presence. So they are in the presence of God the Father, and it is in God's presence that they hear the words, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. Uh, which goes back to what Jessica said. This is an affirmation of Jesus's identity. He is the Son of God. It's back to the baptism too, where uh, it's a voice says, "This is my little son." My yeah, son, it's actually very interesting that you mention that because when Mark describes uh, Jesus's baptism, um, it's just uh, let me see. It's not clear at first who hears that phrase. Uh, so I, I flipped back to chapter 1. The baptism story starts at verse 9. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I'm well pleased. There's a sense in which... That voice is just going to Jesus in that particular story. But as you're mentioning, same phrase, but this time it's not just Jesus. It's the disciples who are with him as well. Yeah, so, so great recollection there. Yes, very good. Um, and then it's over. And they don't see Elijah and Moses anymore. It's just... Jesus and the disciples again. And so they start walking down the mountain. Uh, Jesus tells them not to tell anyone. Again, the same secrecy thing. Uh, and they kept discussing to themselves, what's rising from the dead mean? Um, now, why, why would they be discussing that? Like um, with their ideas of the Messiah, um, Jewish people at this time, they actually did have a notion of resurrection. Um, the general belief of most Jewish peoples, with the exception of the Sadducees and a couple of others, um, was that at the end of all time, God is going to judge all of humanity. And as part of that judgment, all people who have ever lived and have died are going to be raised back to life as part of this judgment and the good to be a part of God's eternal kingdom and the bad to whatever happens to them. They go to the bad place. Um, so the Jewish people believe resurrection is going to happen, but it's going to be a long time from now whenever God ends all the things. So when Jesus starts talking about himself rising from the dead, that doesn't really jive with their viewpoint. They think, how can an individual person come back from the dead in the middle of the existence we're all still a part of. Resurrection only happens at the end. So they're, they're, that is confounding to them. They don't understand how that could be 
possible, which is why they, they continue to discuss it. Then they do ask Jesus, uh, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus' reply is, not only does Elijah come first, he already has. And Mark has already shown us who Elijah is in Mark. It's John, John the Baptist. And, and, and what they're referring to is Elijah's job is to prepare the way for the Messiah. John has done that already. Yeah. Okay, very good. Bob and Laurie, next section. Okay. Um, when they returned to the other disciples, they saw the large crowd surrounding them and, and some of the other teachers. And one of the men says, I brought my son here for you to heal him. You know, to ask your disciples. And they couldn't do it. And He kind of rebukes them and says, well, you know, what, you guys can't do it? Mm -hmm. And he heals the boy, and when he heals him, Jesus said, anything is possible if a person believes. And the Father cries, I, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. And then it goes, goes on. Um, he cast the demon out, and the boy is, is cured. And then Jesus replies, this kind can only be cast out by prayer. Um, I think the theme is that for whatever reason, I don't think the disciples, when they're out on their own, when they're in pairs and they're out spreading the word, they perform miracles all over the place. Yeah, they're driving out demons. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I think in the shadow of Christ, I think they're greatly overwhelmed and they just, you know, you're the Messiah, this, you know, I can't do this and, and be on the same level as you. I, I, I'm not sure what mm -hmm. um, they were thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the theme is that anything is possible through prayer and belief. The father believed, and he asked the disciples instead of telling Jesus, I believe, and the son was cured. And the disciples, I think, they had doubts, in the, in the, like I said, in the shadow of, of Christ. And my question is, why couldn't the kid... Uh, disciples cast out the demon in his presence. Was it because they thought they were unworthy? Um, did they? I don't know. Still didn't believe strong enough. Yeah, it's a great question. Great question. Yeah. So let's explore it. Um, so right after this profound experience on top of the mountain, where Jesus is transfigured or actually the word uh, in Greek I'm sorry I'm kind of backing up but I meant to point this out earlier because it's pretty cool um, the word is metamorphose that's where the word metamorphosis comes from NIV translates it as transfigured, but it can also be translated as transformed. The idea is that Jesus is changed into the form uh, that keeps with 
his inner reality or, or identity. In other words, this is who he truly is. And the sense is that at the transfiguration that this is his resurrected self. Um, this is what he will look like. That's why, that's why Moses and Elijah have that same sort of transcendent quality. They are already metamorphosed into who they are truly meant to be. So they have this really profound experience. They come down the mountain. All the other disciples are in this dispute along with a crowd with the teachers of the law. And in the midst of this dispute, we have this interaction with this, man's, this man and, and his son who has a demon. And, and as rightly noted, uh, he asks the disciples to drive out the spirit, but they couldn't. So Jesus, yes, he rebukes. Seems as though he's rebuking maybe even more than just the disciples. Um, it could be just the disciples, but I mean, there's an entire crowd gathered here at this point, and he says, you unbelieving generation, seemingly to everyone who is there. How long shall I stay with you? How long should I put up with you? So they bring him the boy. Uh, he goes into convulsion. <laughs> like the way that Mark tells us, he goes into the convulsion, and then Jesus asks, how long has the boy been like this? <laughs> and he's still in the convulsion. <laughs> Uh, from childhood. So I just imagine this conversation is taking place and the boy's convulsing. He's foam, foaming at the mouth right in front of them. Uh, so you, can, you should, with that in mind, see a desperation out of the father's voice when he says, it's often thrown him into the fire or the water to kill him. Can you please do anything? Take pity on us. Help. And Jesus is like, and you should read a, a sense of sarcasm if i can said jesus everything is possible for one who believes and then the father exclaims i do believe help me overcome my unbelief fascinating phrase eology there in the sense that he he says he believes and all of his actions actually indicate belief he's gone to the disciples who have had the power to cast out demons they can't do it. So then he turns to Jesus, believing that Jesus can do it. So all of his actions line up with him actually believing, but then he confesses, help me overcome my unbelief. There's a sense in which he believes, and maybe there is doubt happening at the same time, and they're being held together, which is very fascinating that, that um, this man is holding both doubt and belief together. So then Jesus sees the crowd after they've kind of been pulled to the side. Jesus sees the crowd coming their way. <laughs> then he rebukes the spirit, sends him out. Spirit shrieks, convulses. And then the people show up and they're like, he's dead. But Jesus lifts him up. Uh, remember, we've had another healing story where they thought someone was dead, but they weren't. And then Jesus lifts that person up. That was um, uh, Jairus' daughter. Yeah. And then the disciples, why couldn't we do it? And Jesus, almost, it seems strange, which is why I think your question is right on. This kind can only come out by prayer. Well, they've had the power to do it, so why couldn't they do it this time? What is different about this particular demon than any of the other ones that they've been able to exercise in the past? So in a lot of ways, it actually leaves us with a lot of questions because Mark doesn't outright answer for us why in this particular case that they weren't able to do it. However, Jesus' response does give us some sense that in the other instances, Jesus had sent them, empowered them to go and just cast out demons. So they just, in Jesus' name, be out, and they go, right? But it could be the case that they tried that this time, and that demon was strong enough to resist. 
and they didn't know what to do from there. Well, my version so, says fasting, prayer, and fasting. Yes, so that's fascinating because that is um, in some later manuscripts, prayer and fasting. Um, but the earliest ones only have prayer, um, which is why the NIV translates it the way that it does. Could it be that man believed, but he didn't have faith in the strength of his belief? Take it a step further. Could his statement, I believe, but help me with my unbelief, be representative of not only himself, but of also the disciples and everybody else in the crowd? We believe, but we still have this unbelief. We still don't. And God, Jesus comes in and says, with this, we need the prayer. Yeah, because what happens in prayer is that God can affirm and help fill with power so that you do believe and that those doubts are abated. Yeah. In fact, the, Jesus' phrase, everything is possible for one who believes, I think can be read in one of three ways. Um, so it could be read as um, referring to Jesus' power. In other words, everything is possible for the one, Jesus, who believes, in other words, it's Jesus' belief that he has the power to do this. So that's one way you can read that. The second way is along the lines of what you were describing, that's the faith of those who are petitioning for whatever it is to happen, in this case, the man, alongside of the crowd and the disciples. Okay? The third way is that both of those can be combined together. That it's a combination of Jesus' power and our response in faith to it that leads to action. Which was the sense that we got from when Jesus went to Nazareth. He certainly had the power to heal people, but no one in Nazareth believed. And so he was only able to do a few miracles. So it wasn't for a lack of power. It was a lack of people's desire for that to occur. Um, and the way that Mark talks about that, that action being played out is that is the action of faith, of belief, and they didn't have it. And in this case, there's, there's a sense of belief and unbelief, seemingly enough so that they needed to pray to receive the belief that they needed for this man to have his son healed from this demon possession. Father's disappointment of not having the first healing, you know, his disappointment could have raised doubts. Would contribute to his unbelief. Great observation. Yeah. Great observation. He would have been really disappointed when he all his belief was that his son would be healed by the disciples, but he wasn't. Great, great observation. Could have been his unbelief. Yeah. Yeah. Could, yeah. It, could yeah. it be partially though? Yeah. Could, it, could it be that? They didn't want the disciples, the crowd, thinking that they had as much power as Christ. Hmm. Certainly the teachers of the law probably don't want people to think that the disciples have the power to do those sorts of things, which could be why there's an argument taking place well, there are other at the beginning there. of the Maybe story. The disciples didn't. The whole conversation, get, get, get a, yeah. They're all for fear of the, the other teachers, and that led to, yeah. Yeah. They couldn't do it. And yeah, because they know there's a growing resentment and tension with the other teachers. Beyond the cross. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Very good observations. Yes. Uh, you're entering into the world of the text. That's very good. Very well done. Good. All right. Next section. Jesus predicts his death a second time. Well, Jesus told the disciples again that he was going to die and that he was going to raise again, but they wouldn't believe him. <laughs> okay. And they, they would say, oh, uh, what's he talking about? Uh, you know, they were just not believe. And then they start arguing about who's the greatest one around here. <laughs> uh, and they were even getting jealous of Peter, James, and John. 
because they were the ones that were included in everything, yeah. and they were. And so they were having this great big argument about, who, which of us is the greatest food? That would be uh, the supreme being around here, you know? Yep. That they, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I hope that you are seeing a pattern that's developing within this section. Okay. In fact, this section and part of what we'll cover next week because we couldn't, we didn't have time to get through chapter ten. But this is all. Mark wants us to read this all together. So. From the point that Jesus heals the blind man in Bethsaida in Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26, to Jesus healing da, 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 a blind man at the end of chapter 10, blind Bartimaeus, that should be read as one section. And within this section, there are multiple repetitions happening. So this is the, the first time that we repeat the death prediction. Okay, death prediction happened earlier at the end of chapter 8, and now we have death prediction happening here for a second time. So he, what, what's a little bit different is that actually he's a little bit more general in his prediction. This time he says the Son of Man is going to be delivered in the, into the hands of men, they will kill him, and after three days he will rise. In the first prediction, he named who was going to reject him and hand him over to be killed. Um, but similarities, the three days, rising back from the dead, um, that he is going to be killed, that all remains. But as Pat said, they still don't get it, even after repeating this whole thing. And they don't get it... Um, in the sense of what it means for them, because they keep arguing about who's going to be greatest. Probably still under the mindset that Jesus is going to take up a sword and he's going to conquer everybody and we get to be second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth and so on in the kingdom. So who gets to be second? They're all arguing about that. Um, which, uh, again, going back to Peter, you don't have the... Uh, mind and concerns of God, you have human concerns in mind. Um, so then Jesus sits down, and in Jewish culture at that time, sitting down was the way that rabbis taught. So this is how you know that this is, this is a big teaching moment for Jesus. He sits down and says, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. As I mentioned earlier, uh, that's not a value in the ancient Roman world. In fact, um, there, I, I mentioned, I think, last week, uh, vice lists. Um, so the Bible has all sorts of different lists of uh, virtues and vices. Paul uses them all the time for things that he thinks are good and do, 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 all sorts of different things, and then things he thinks are bad, do, 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 they're all vices. Uh, Mark has a vice list. And, and many people in the ancient world, especially philosophers, they would come up with their lists of virtues and vices. And in most um, philosophers and teachers in their writings from this time period, humility and service were not in the list of virtues. In fact, they're vices, actually. Pride is a virtue. In other words, the, the belief that you are confident in oneself and you will do what it takes to get what you need to survive and to excel in society, that was a virtue. Um, being lowly and humble and acting like, goodness, this fly. Uh, <laughs> acting in service of one another, that, that was actually a vice. They saw you are less than, you are a servant, you are a, right, weak. 
Yes, exactly. So for Jesus to say this would have, uh, once again, they, they would have railed against that. They, that would have been, ooh, I don't want to hear that, Jesus. And then he exemplifies it by taking a little child. In the ancient world, in this time period, little children had very low status. Um, and, and the social hierarchy, you, know, you got powerful men, you got merchant men, You've got maybe men who um, own farms but can take care of their family, um, poor men, uh, women, slaves, children. And, yeah, yeah, women, slaves, children, all kind of at the bottom together. Uh, yeah. And then uh, people who have diseases. Um, yeah, right. And then people who've been shamed because they didn't follow uh, social customs and laws also toward the bottom of the social standing. So Jesus takes a little child and embraces the child as an act of saying, this is the type of people that we're going to become. We're going to be people that are for the lowly. We are going to embrace them um, and not only embrace them, but be like them, serve like them and welcome them which is why he says in verse 37, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name, they, in extension, they welcome me. And when you welcome me, you welcome the one who sent me. Yeah. Very good. All right, last section. They reflect, he's reflecting a judgmental attitude and pride in the way he approaches uh -huh. this question to Jesus. And Jesus follows that up in the next section by referring to this group of people as the little ones. Uh -huh. I think that we, we took that as the little ones in the faith. Basically, it's how we, we read that. Uh -huh. And he warns against you know what pride and having a judgmental attitude leads to, which is sin and death. And he goes to a number of different metaphors over here that uh, we weren't sure what all of them meant, uh -huh. but they basically are pointing to the same thing. You should work daily at uh, basically building your faith and removing those things in your life that are sinful. Good. And way to see the connections between the entire section, because you're absolutely right. Um, those all need to be read in context, and that's how we understand what's happening when he's using phrases like, if your hand offends you, cut it off. Right? It's hyperbole on his part. So let's, let's back up a little bit. Uh, oh, actually, I haven't heard your question yet. So question, and then, and then we'll uh, um, address what's happening. Oh, 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 they, yeah, who's the someone driving out demons? Yeah, 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 yeah. don't know. <laughs> Great question. Great question. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Yeah, Mark doesn't seem to care. That doesn't matter that someone... It matters in the sense for the narrative that he wants to draw out these ideas and themes, but whoever the particularities are of that person, that part doesn't matter. Um, very well read about um, a sense of pride that they have in we're the ones who've been called by Jesus to cast out demons. They don't understand that the calling that Jesus gives to them and their commissioning to then go and cast out demons and heal people extends beyond them. It's not just for them. It's for everyone else. And, and so he says, don't stop him. Um, when they're doing things in my name, it's not like the next sentence they're going to bash me. Um, 
for whoever is not against us is for us. And then in 41 connects the theme of servitude. Anyone who gives you a cup of water, that, that would be a, an act of service. Typically a slave or servant would do that in the household of someone who had means. Um, those are people who belong to the Messiah and they will not lose their reward. So again, really well done in connecting pride and sin to what's happening in the next section. And uh, those who believe in me, the little ones, have been interpreted in one of two ways generally. As you said, little ones in the faith or children. Um, and it could be either or. And the context can lead to, to either being the case. Um, and, but then Jesus uses some very strong hyperbole for those who cause others to stumble, uh, that it would be better for them that, <laughs> to have a large millstone. This is not just some small stone. This is a stone that donkeys are using to crush uh, grain and things like that, um, put around their neck, thrown into the sea. He's yeah, he is serious. He's, he's definitely using hyperbole, so please don't read into this, oh, I need to go cut off my hand, because uh, that's not what Jesus is saying. What he is saying is you should take these things seriously that can put obstacles in the path of those who want to follow Jesus, and not only those who want to follow Jesus, but also yourself. The things that cause you to stumble, you should cut it off. You should get rid of it. You should run far away from it. Because then you could be liable to going to Gehenna if you don't. It doesn't. <laughs> it's the word that most English translations translate as hell. Uh, the word henna actually, or Gehenna, um, literally means uh, valley of Hinnom. It's an actual place. There's a valley outside of Jerusalem, and in this valley, um, the ancient pagan polytheistic peoples would do um, child sacrifice in this valley. Uh, so a very despicable place. Jewish people would have found that to be absolutely abhorrent. Um, and so once they kicked out all of the pagans, they used the valley as dump. So they'd take out all their trash out into the valley and set it on fire and let it decompose and rot. Uh, so Jesus is giving them a, a picture of a place where things that are not useful for anything, they're not good for anything anymore, they go to be consumed. They go to go away where it's torment. It's fire burning all the time. They, they probably had a picture in their mind of smoldering fires that are just always happening and worms that are helping to decompose all the trash in this valley, which is why you have this play of fire and worms in Jesus's response. So it's, it's this idea that then becomes the, the more foundational metaphysical idea of what we now consider to be hell. This place that we go to, well, hopefully not us, uh, people, people go to when they are not who they are supposed to be. Hold on to that. Um, it's, it's not just about, hell isn't just a place for people who mess up. It's a place for people who are not who they are supposed to be. They are not living into God's desires and purposes for them, which is 
rooted in relationship with God, of course. Those are those who go to hell. And it is those who have a tendency to get caught up in sin and pride and the things that cause themselves and others to stumble. So then Jesus says, and this is kind of some weird mixing of metaphors, that everyone will be salted with fire. What? Salted with fire? What does that mean? So you got a mix of salt, which was very useful in the ancient world, um, obviously for taste, same sorts of things we use it for now, but it was also a preservative. Um, people thought it had healing properties. Um, so salt was used for all sorts of different things. Um, so that's a good thing. Fire, generally actually a good thing as well. You use it to cook, but also dangerous. It has the ability to destroy, uh, but also in its very hot, intense state can also purify. So there's this mix of metaphors happening together. Everyone will be salted with fire. So what does that mean? Potentially, it means that um, people are going to go through testing. Um, as fire can destroy, it can also reform and purify. Um, and there's a sense in which we are salt, we are useful for something, but that fire can actually purify us and make us more salty. That's the mix of the metaphor. So that's what Jesus then continues to say in verse 50, that salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? So allow that fire to refine you as salt and have salt amongst yourselves. Be salty together. Be at peace with one another. Don't be caught up in pride. Don't be caught up in power games, which is what we continue to see with the disciples um, arguing amongst themselves, thinking, oh, maybe I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. You know. By the way, we're going to see that again in chapter 10. So they didn't get that done. Yeah, they still haven't got that. Yeah. Which goes back to my, what I was saying about repetition. The, these same themes are going to keep coming up. You're going to see little children again in chapter 10. We're going to see um, a rich person who um, has it all figured out, except for one thing. Right? Um, you'll see a, a third death prediction. We'll see James and John. Can we be at your right and your left, Jesus? <laughs> and, then, and then the section ends with the repetition of a blind man being freed from his blindness. Yeah. So it's kind of ironic. Here we sit reading this going, wow, there's a disciple standing right next to Jesus. They don't see him, they don't see him. But here we are reading this day in and day out. And where are we? We're still kind of on the blind side here. Does that make sense? Yep. We have it but in black and white and the picture of everything they did wrong. And mankind still, even though it's sitting here in black and white, and they're telling you these guys, and God kept going, oh, dear Lord, come on, just, just one day. Just yeah. one day, please. One day. Yeah. And I can still see God going, Oh, here we go again. Does it make sense? I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's right here. Yeah. And we still it's human nature. Yeah. So this is a good this is a good segue then to our so what section. Why does this matter? So for the disciples, there there are things that are inhibiting their sight of what's really happening. So what are the things that blind us? from seeing who Jesus is and what Jesus really wants to do. Okay, similar things. Money, pride. Yep. Okay. Pain, too. Pain. Mm-hmm. Emotional pain just blinds you to... Yeah. What about worldviews? Right? The disciples' view of what a Messiah is. Their view of values. Servant. 
humble, that's, those aren't our virtues. Those aren't our values. Yeah. And I think our own worldviews also can at times inhibit our ability to see who Jesus is and what the kingdom is really about. I'll give you a perfect example. I think our own culture is incredibly individualistic. Yes. We, we care about ourselves much more than we care about community, about other people. Um, I think Jesus, if he came and, and, you know, gospels were written in this day and age, much of what Jesus would be teaching about and reacting against is how individualistic and self-centered we are. What else? I had a question in the uh, first part of chapter 9 there. I was talking about um, disciples seeing the kingdom of God. Was that the resurrection? Yeah, I think, yeah, so so this is chapter 9, verse 1, right? right? So this is Jesus saying, truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. I think Jesus in that moment is referring to the, the kingdom of God coming in power is his crucifixion and resurrection. In other words, um, what it means to be a part of Christ's kingdom, in other words, his way of doing things, his reality, his order, is to sacrifice oneself, even to the point of death, on behalf of others, because that's where the real life is, and that's where the power is, because that's where resurrection happens. Great question. Disciples didn't even believe after the resurrection until after Jesus showed himself uh, to them in, in Jerusalem. Yeah. I mean, they would not even believe the people that saw him and, and would go and tell them uh, Jesus is alive. And they'd say, oh, you're just saying that or something. Right? Yeah, actually, yeah. So remember last week we had the story of the blind man who Jesus had to touch twice. And Tim pointed out that this could be a great way of talking about our own spiritual lives. There's a sense in which we have a sense of what's happening, but as we grow in faith, there are times where we need another experience, another revelation, another way of seeing more clearly. For the disciples, that second work of God's revelation to them seems to be Pentecost. That's the way that the New Testament describes when they really get it. So yes, you're right. Not until many, many days, 50 days after Jesus has resurrected, do they have this transformative experience that truly opens their eyes to who Jesus is and, and then who they're supposed to be and how they're supposed to live in light of that. Great observation, yeah. And I think for us, too, that throughout our lives, we need that as well. So that's why Nazarenes have emphasized what we call sanctification, this moment in which we give all of ourselves to God, and in giving all of ourselves to God, God fills us with his spirit so that we can see clearly and not so blindly as before or as through a veil again that's more new testament language that the jewish people prior to jesus they saw it dimly through a veil they kind of got it but not all of it um, but in jesus and in pentecost through the spirit we have our eyes wide opened well you're talking about a veil but that's when the temple the curtain the yeah, 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 that's a different, yeah, a different <laughs> metaphor there. Yeah, yeah, yes. It is because yep. of the resurrection. Correct. Of the yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're, 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 we're jumping a little bit ahead in Mark's narrative here. Uh, so not spoiler alert or anything, but the symbolism of the temple's uh, curtain being torn is that the Spirit of God is loose. It's not stuck in the temple anymore. It has gone out of the temple 
And it's fascinating. What is the climactic point in which the spirit has left the temple and is loose? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what point in the narrative does that happen? Yes, it's in his death. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, so, so which is a big point for Mark. For Mark, it's Jesus' death that is the climactic point. The resurrection has to happen, but it's actually the death that is the most significant. Which is why Mark keeps emphasizing death. We're going to go to the cross. Whoever loses their life, those are the ones that find it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Which, uh, yeah, if we think about that too much, it might be morbid. But uh, in terms of the spiritual life, the idea is it's when we surrender all of ourselves. That's where the life is. That's where the power is. That's when the spirit gets loose. And that's why it's so scary, too. That's why we can't surrender completely. Yeah, we like to have it's control. Scary to yeah. Lose. Yeah. So it comes back to power again. Control. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Really great thoughts tonight. Uh, great observations in your groups. Great questions from each of you. Well done. I like, I like doing the small group thing every once in a while. It's good to hear how you're reading and how you're interpreting what's happening in the text. You're doing a great job of that. Uh, so yeah, we'll probably do that one or two more times as we go through the series. Uh, next week, we're definitely going to get through chapter 10. So if you want to read ahead, you can. Um, and I'm, I still haven't figured out how I want to throw chapter 11 in here yet. So we'll see. Originally, my plan was to do 11 and 12 together, but I know we can't get through 10, 11, and 12. So we'll see what happens. At least read 10. <laughs> I know it's not a long book, but I just have too much to say about it. Yeah, I know. Look at uh, Pat's. Hers is bigger than mine. Yeah. Oh, okay. Never mind. Mine's bigger then. Actually, so so actually, the one that Pat has is the older version of this. It's from the same series. It's called the Beacon Bible Commentaries, and they redid them. Uh, a few years ago. So this is a pretty new version of commentary. That, that's the original version of that, which I also have in my office. So every once in a while, I refer to it as well, because a little bit different viewpoint than what I have. So anyway, uh, that's an aside. Good job, everybody. Have a great rest of your week. And see you on Sunday, if not next Monday. Yep.